So I'm going to introduce Ray's talk. Ray's talk is going to be about gender bias in Lyme disease. The concept of gender bias in general is kind of exploding on the healthcare scene. You may or may not be aware of some of the things that have come out recently, but this is from the Bill Gates and Melinda Gates annual letter, and they're talking about data can be sexist. And essentially what they mean is we're not asking uh, about women, we're not asking about girls, and we're not actually analyzing the differences that might occur between men and women, particularly with respect to health care. Now, this is a book that was put out recently by Maya Dusenberry, and she's talking about the concept of uh, what is being studied. And she's saying that women were excluded from a number of studies for a period of time. Their research data was not kept separate, even when they were included in studies, so they were given out as average results. So as a result, there's a lot of things that we don't know about women and how women are reacting uh, in terms of health. This is from the Society to Improve Diagnosis in Medicine. They've done a lot of great work uh, on this area, and here they're talking about how women who are in the middle of a heart attack experience 16-minute delays in diagnosis and treatment. Here again, they're talking about how women are 50 to 75 percent more likely to experience an adverse drug reaction than men are. This is a chief medical officer. He says, the knowledge gap is very real. It's very true that the vast majority of studies in medicine were done on men, and usually pretty healthy men. So there is built-in biases to the knowledge that we have been given. And a final article here, medicine's biggest blind spot, women's bodies. And then if you haven't seen this, which just recently came out in Nature, this is about how the neurological pathways for pain are different in men than they are in women. So with that, Ray, I'm going to hand it over to you and let you talk a little bit about bias. Okay, so I'm going to talk about uh, gender differences in Lyme disease, and Lorraine did touch on this a bit. Uh, and I'm going to show you the evidence that women may be at a disadvantage when it comes to dealing with this disease uh, and show you why that is. Uh, I'm going to talk uh, about four categories, basically initial infection uh, and then uh, and, the, and the response to initial infection, and also go over uh, humoral immunity and cellular immunity in Lyme disease, and then finally uh, talk a little bit about pregnancy uh, in, in the time I have left. So um, initial infection in Lyme disease, why would women be more likely to get Lyme disease than men? So this is a study done by a group in Illinois. It's kind of an interesting study. What they did was they took a plexiglass tube with um, holes at both ends, and they put gauze at the ends, and they put a, a hole in the middle, and they had a man sit at one end and breathe, and a woman sit at the other end and breathe. And then they released these ticks. They happen to be Lone Star ticks, but they could be any tick, into the hole in the middle, and they looked at which way the tick would go. Would it go toward the man or the woman? And what they found was that these ticks, 42% of the time, would go toward the woman, and only 18% of the time would go toward the man. So what this suggests is that there's something in female breath that, atta that attracts ticks, and that may be why women get bitten by ticks more than men. Um, How big is that too? Um, it was so. Actually, that's that's actually I'm, very I'm good. I'm sure it's not big enough. That's actually a very good question because there was a similar study done using uh, Ixodes ticks, and they only had about two centimeters on each side. This tube had five centimeters on each side, and the tick had to go five centimeters in order to be considered positive to that side or, or the other side. So. That, that seemed to be important. So now what about uh, the rash? You know, Lyme disease gets diagnosed by EM rashes, and EM rashes uh, have uh, different sizes and shapes as shown on this slide. And basically, you know, the classic EM rash is a bullseye rash, and when there's no bullseye rash, patients tend to get not diagnosed. So this was a study done in Sweden. Uh, where they looked at the appearance of the EM rash uh, in patients who were exposed to the types of Borrelia that are prevalent in Sweden, which is Borrelia uh, Afzalian-Gurini. So that's different from the type that's prevalent in the United States, which is 
uh, Borrelia burgdorferi sensu strictu, but they were looking at these two, strain, these two species that are prevalent in Sweden to see if there was a gender difference in the rashes that men got versus women. And the next slide, this is a very difficult slide to understand, but basically what they found was that women were 10 times as likely as men to get an atypical Lyme rash. So at least with one type of Borrelia, Borrelia afzali. So basically if you take one as the standard uh, for women, men were only a tenth as likely to get that, that rash. Um, and then for Borrelia Bre garini, interestingly, both men and women had twice as much chance of having an atypical rash uh, for, for that type, for that species of Borrelia. So, so there was likely that both men and women would be misdiagnosed because the rash would be atypical. Now, this study, as far as I know, has never been done for Borrelia burgdorferi, but it would be kind of an interesting study to do now that we can, um, we can speciate the Borrelia and see what people are infected with and compare that to their rashes. So let's move on to the immune system, and this is going to be my 30-second summary of the humoral and the cellular immune system. So the humoral immune system, shown on the left, is based on antibody reactivity, primarily, and antibodies bind to organisms like viruses and spirochetes and bacteria and can kill them in different ways. Uh, the cellular immune system is based more on these um, transmitters called cytokines, which stimulate different cell types to then attack and kill infected cells. So that, in 30 seconds, is the human immune system. Um, it's a little more complicated than that, but, you know, we'll get to that. Um, so let's look at antibody, the humoral part of the immune system, in terms of Lyme disease. And here on the left you have Ms. Diagnosis, who's saying, you have a few little positives on the Western blot, but I don't think it means anything. And in fact, that has been a, a big problem with diagnosing Lyme using antibody-based testing. And on the right, you see all the bands that are used on the Western blot that can react with different antibodies. Some are specific for Lyme, some are not specific for Lyme. Uh, this has been a, a constant cause of confusion. Um, but in terms of gender differences, this is a study that was done a long time ago by Henry Fader, who was a prominent Lyme denialist from Connecticut. And uh, he was trying to show that there really wasn't a lot of Lyme disease in Connecticut, or at least not as much as we thought. And so he was doing Western blots on, on men and women. And what he found, although he never really reported this, is that men tended to have an average of six positive bands on their Western blots, whereas women had an average of only four positive bands on their Western blots in this study that he did. Now, the CDC criteria for a positive Western blot is five bands. Oops, sorry. So based on this, you can see that women would be at a disadvantage in terms of diagnosing Lyme disease based on their Western blot. And um, this study was sort of reproduced by uh, John Alcott's group more recently. Um, these funny looking uh, uh, characters here look, are, are basically looking at the ELISA screening test for Lyme, which is another antibody-based test. And as you can see, men have an average of three, well, this is a, actually a quality scale, so their ELISA was positive uh, at a rate of three and a half. Women, on the other hand, had ELISAs that were positive at only two. So men had much stronger responses on their ELISA testing than women. And then when he looked at the Western blot response, uh, his results were even worse than faders because here you can see men had an average of four, only four bands on their Western blots, whereas women had an average of only two bands. So again, women were at a disadvantage when they were tested using this two-tier system with the ELISA and the Western blot. And uh, to look at this another way, this is also from the same group, um, what happens to this testing during the course of Lyme disease? So men, it turns out, started out with 30% negative tests, and then about 35% of uh, men converted to positive during the time of this study, and then there are about 35% more who were positive throughout the study. But look at what happens with women women had almost 50% who were negative when the study started. Only about 15% of those converted, seroconverted during the study. And again, there were 33% or so who were positive. 
So women, again, were at a huge disadvantage when it came to positive testing and conversion to positive testing with this system. Now, this is a very busy slide, and it's, uh, it's kind of it has a lot in it, but this is also a study done by Ocott's group, um, which was referred to previously. Uh, this was a study where they looked at an insurance database that had something like 500,000 patients, and they found over 52,000 who looked like they had Lyme disease, and they compared that to the controls, matched controls, and they had about 263,000 matched controls. So this is really a classic kind of big data study. And what they found is that women who were diagnosed with what they call post-treatment Lyme disease syndrome, PTLDS, which we like to call chronic Lyme disease, women tended to have more symptoms than men. So 68% of the women had symptoms versus only 57% of the men with chronic Lyme disease. So what this suggests is that women are more symptomatic with chronic Lyme disease. It also suggests that women may fail treatment more, and that's why they have more symptoms if they have chronic Lyme disease, although the study didn't specifically look for that. But it does suggest that there's a higher failure rate of treatment for women based on this study. And then this is another study looking at not just gender, but ethnicity for um, diagnosis of Lyme based on the CDC sanctioned two-tier testing. And in the bottom panel, B, you see non-Hispanic patients. And there's this bimodal distribution of positive testing, one in, the, uh, in childhood and then one in uh, later adulthood. And as you can see, every single one of these bars, there's more common positive testing in men, the black bars, versus women, the white bars. However, if you look at Hispanic patients uh, using the same criteria, uh, first of all, the, 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 two, the bimodal distribution gets a little more blurry because there's a lot more patients in this medium age, age group that are positive. And in this medium age group, there are more women in some categories who are positive than men. So there does seem to be a difference in reactivity on the two-tier system uh, for men and women. And for Hispanics, it seems to be more that, that more women are positive than men. So there's some difference in how the test, how these groups respond uh, in this testing. So that's the humoral immune system. What about cellular immunity? Now, cellular immunity is based, as I mentioned, is based on cytokines. There's basically two kinds of cytokines. There are inflammatory cytokines, which are represented by tumor necrosis factor alpha and interferon gamma. And then there are inhibitor, in, inhibitory cytokines, which are represented by interleukin-4 and interleukin-10. So if you think of it in the, those two categories, that's really what's important, the ones that cause inflammation, the ones that's, that inhibit inflammation. And as this little cartoon on the right shows, of course, things are much more complicated because different cells secrete different cytokines, but I'm not going to get into that. But just think of the inflammatory and inhibitory cytokines. Now, this was another study done in Sweden back in 2006, and um, they were looking at um, what causes reinfection with, with Lyme Borrelia. Now, why is this reinfection? Because these were patients who had persistent symptoms of Lyme disease, and in 2006 in Sweden there was no chronic Lyme disease and there was barely post-treatment Lyme disease. So if these patients had persistent symptoms, they must have gotten reinfected, right? But these were actually patients with chronic Lyme disease, basically. And they wanted to look at the immune response in these patients, and specifically the, the cellular immune response. So, and what they did was they measured a bunch of things, and I always like to show a slide like this when I'm talking about the immune system, because just when you think you've figured out everything about the immune system, you realize how really complicated it is, because then you won't understand anything here. But um, aside from that, uh, let's tease out the uh, cytokines I talked about. So uh, this was a comparison of interferon gamma, which is an inflammatory cytokine, with IL-4, which is, oops, which is an inhibitory cytokine. And what you see here is that men with the dark bars have a slightly, a somewhat increased level of interferon gamma, but they have a suppressed level of IL-4. So men have an increase in, inflam in inflammatory cytokines and a decrease in inhibitory cytokines. So what does that mean in other terms? So Men have Paul Revere, who's kind of walking through town, going, hey, the British are coming, meet me down at the pub. 
<laughs> but at the same time, they're unlocking the muskets, they're pulling out the cannons, they're getting ready to fight, right? Women, on the other hand, have this, you know, this increased response to inter with interferon, if I can get this to work, uh, on the left, but they also have an exaggerated response with IL-4, with the inhibitory cytokines. So women have Paul Revere galloping through town yelling, the British are coming, the British are coming, but at the same time, they're locking up the muskets, they're putting away the cannons, and they're not getting ready to fight. So they have this kind of paradoxical response to, uh, to the infection, and this is shown again using two other cytokines, TNF-alpha, which is again um, an inflammatory cytokine, and then IL-10, which is an inhibitory cytokine. And again, you see the men have a somewhat increased level of TNF-alpha, but they have a suppressed level of IL-10, so increased inflammatory cytokines, decreased inhibitory cytokines. The women, on the other hand, have a significantly increased level of inflammatory cytokines, but also an increased level of the inhibitory cytokine. So the same thing, this exaggerated response that's somewhat paradoxical because it's both inflammatory and inhibitory. And if you look at this overall, this is kind of, unfortunately, they reversed the, um, the two parameters here, but women, uh, on the net in women is they have an inhibitory response to infection. Now, why would women have that? Who's got the one word answer? Pregnancy. pregnancy, very good. Because the inflammatory cytokine response is toxic to pregnancy, and women, their priority is to protect the fetus, to protect the pregnancy. And that's why they have this paradoxical response to Borrelia that, um, that basically interferes with their response to infection and can make the infection much worse in women. So to conclude, women may attract more ticks and have more atypical Lyme rashes than men. Uh, commercial two-tier Lyme testing favors men over women because men have more positive ELISA tests and more positive Western blots. Women have an exaggerated response to Borrelia infection with more inflammatory and more inhibitory cytokines than men, and this may promote the evolution of chronic Lyme disease. And women may also have a higher treatment failure um, because of, of, of this response. Um, and then in the last few minutes, I want to talk a little bit about congenital Lyme disease. Um, here's our poster child. Um, uh, congenital Lyme disease was discussed at the Tick-Borne Disease Working Group meeting, and they came up with some um, uh, conclusions about it that we really basically need to do more work on this because there is a problem, although it's not quite clear what the problem is. Um, this was, most of this was based on a very recent study done on uh, pregnancy and Lyme disease. Um, and it showed that in 59 pregnancies, 61% um, of those women had health issues, and that's about three times the normal rate for pregnancy. And also when they looked at the babies born from those pregnancies, only 39% of those babies were healthy. So this suggests there's a big problem with congenital Lyme disease. And what kind of problems do these babies have? Uh, this is a study that was done uh, based on Charles Ray Jones's uh, population, and it was published in the Lyme Times, and Lorraine was involved in this many years ago. And this shows you a list of all the problems that these children have with congenital Lyme disease, and there's a lot of problems related to, to that um, form of transmission. So I think there's a lot more that we need to learn about congenital Lyme. Uh, we may learn more if we have some animal models of this, uh, which would help. Um, and then uh, on top of that, the other big question, which keeps coming up, as you heard, is what about contact sexual transmission of Lyme disease? This is another issue that has yet to be resolved. <laughs>